Welcome everybody to a new Innovators Update. My name is Richard Hulskus, co-founder of Revolver. We are today, as usual, speaking with Rachel Gordon, communications and media officer at MIT, who today has invited a PhD researcher uh, from MIT CSIL to talk with us. Welcome, Rachel. Hey, Rich. Thanks for having us. So Alexander Amini is a PhD student at CSAIL, and he does some really cool work with autonomous vehicles. And specifically, he's building machine learning algorithms for end-to-end -end control of autonomous systems. He's formulating confidence of deep neural networks, and he's doing mathematical modeling of human mobility. Alex, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a really honor to be here. Great. Okay, so Alex, deep learning, pretty ubiquitous in society. Autonomous driving, medical diagnostics, making timely decisions. Are we confident enough that artificial intelligence is smart enough to know when it can't be trusted? Yeah, it's a great question. I think maybe just to start, I, I just want to first of all say that we've all seen these like amazing news articles and media coverage on the amazing things that AI and deep learning is doing in today's society. Like, like you said, we hear about like autonomous driving, teaching robots how to walk, uh, defeating grandmasters in Go and chess, right? So like really amazing achievements in this field. Uh, but I feel like what a lot of these articles really, and like what a lot of like the public perception about the field is failing to capture is kind of that a lot of these AIs that have been really even achieving superhuman performance are also susceptible to really catastrophic failures on the 0.1% of their training data. And when we consider uh, very safe to critical domains like autonomous driving or robotics, this is really hugely important because any type of catastrophic failure, for example, if the robot encounters a situation which it wasn't sufficiently trained for, if it, we sometimes recall these situations like out of distribution because it comes from like something that the robot has never really seen before in its training data, that can be like hugely important to, to our overall performance. And we don't necessarily only care about the accuracy of the, the robot, but we really do care in a lot of these cases about that 0.1%. Uh, so a lot of what I think uh, I'm really interested in is how we can build robots that not just are super performant on average overall, but also can tell us when they may not know the answer so that we as humans can kind of step in and try to make some more informed decision now that we know some rough estimate of how much we can trust our models. And I would say that for deep learning specifically, uh, this is a huge problem in the field because a lot of times deep learning is almost regarded as black box solution, very uninterpretable. Training these models can take uh, billions of parameters. Now we've even reached the level of trillions of parameters. So these are massive, massive models. They can take weeks or even many weeks to train. So now when we talk about understanding when we can trust a model, this goes into a really interesting, I think, field because what does it mean to really understand how we can trust the model and how can we kind of quantify this, right? So I think this uh, idea of trusting a model and knowing when we don't know the answer is almost completely lost in a lot of uh, the really exciting deep learning advances that we do see, but it's something that I think uh, in our work at CSAIL, we're very excited to really be focusing on because we do see this as a key problem towards the future of robotics and the future of deep learning to actually start to adopt these systems in real life. Right. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about your research that focuses mm -hmm. on this topic. And you created a network to determine uncertainty using indoor home and outdoor driving images. And the better the training data, the more likely the future predictions will work. So how accurate were those future predictions? Yeah, so the way our model worked was it was based on what is known as evidential learning theory. And to understand this first, basically we need to consider how typical neural networks and deep learning models are trained. So usually uh, the way we train a neural network is we showed a bunch of examples of some data set. So we can show a bunch of cats as pictures and we try to predict that the next cat that we see is actually a cat. 
Now, evidential neural networks, which is this, uh, uh, this field that we're very interested in, is aiming not just to learn that decision or prediction, but also have the neural network learn how much evidence it has to support that decision, right? So similar to a human, if we're asked a human, as the, if we're asked a question to a human, uh, we can produce an answer, but our answer may, may vary person to person, right? Because not every person may have the same evidence to support that answer. Uh, so that's kind of the, the accuracy of the system is very dependent, like you said, on the training data and how much evidence it can kind of acquire during learning, right? So during learning, it's going to see all these examples, slowly start to build up evidence here and there for different examples. So that when it sees a new example, it can kind of remember like where in the training data it saw this and, and how much evidence can support it. Now, a lot of times the evidence is, is correlated to the amount of confidence that you should place in this network and its trust. Um, so this kind of leads into some of these ideas of safety and, and robustness of the model downstream. Mm -hmm. So if your system could distinguish between real and doctored photos, this could be very powerful for deep fakes and data manipulation. Yeah, definitely. So actually, in fact, we tested against uh, adversarial data. So that means when we have data that not necessarily was just uh, from a different distribution. So maybe if we have autonomous driving, we're not just testing on nighttime images if we, if we trained on daytime, right? So that would be an example of something that's just out of distribution. But adversarial examples, like you said, and deep fakes, this is kind of where we uh, go to the extreme, right? We like artificially perturb the network to the extreme. So we take a daytime image and we make it extremely hard for that network to recognize how to drive in this image, right? So we tested this and these changes, I would say that they're extremely imperceptible to the human eye. But when a machine sees them, it can make the machine go completely wrong and make like catastrophic failures, especially in the case of autonomous driving when we tested this. So seeing this more and more in real world robotics and computer vision applications now uh, is, is extremely relevant, uh, especially with the, the rise of all of these deep fakes that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And maybe just to bring this into the context of robotics, because I think this is a really interesting example. In driving, we often have these cases where uh, stop signs, for example, maybe uh, you may add a sticker to a stop sign or maybe as a human, you can wear a certain type of t-shirt and these t-shirts can actually be designed to make computer vision systems not be able to detect that human anymore. So these are almost like adversarial t-shirts that are robust to different types of lighting change. And depending on how like different viewpoints that the car comes in contact with the human, they can kind of see the pattern on the t-shirt or the sticker on the stop sign and make the stop sign invisible. Right, so these are like actually a huge real world problem as well. These aren't necessarily just like something we fabricate in the lab. These can be actually just like printed stickers that you place onto a stop sign that have huge implication. And even more so, we're starting to see what I like to call natural adversarial examples that are starting to appear during robot deployment where um, they aren't necessarily constructed by humans where we print a sticker and place it onto a stop sign but we may simply uh, just appear a, a, or encounter a state of the robot that is so different than anything that we encounter during training. So it's just something natural that occurs in the environment. And this is something that actually we're also having a lot of uh, focus on now within our lab in the context of simulation. So we're actually developing these very photorealistic simulation engines that are capable of synthesizing these natural adversarial examples so that we can test our, our algorithms and how much we can trust these models, even in these types of cases that are like very confusing because they look super natural, right? And there's something that you would encounter in real life, uh, but the network should like absolutely not be trusted in these scenarios and they, they will fail if they are. That's really interesting. And you know, it's making me think about how judgment, it's so subjective and every human probably has a different moral code for how they make their decisions and all of their previous experiences that go into that judgment. So is all of this work kind of getting us closer to letting machines have kind of a natural judgment? 
Exactly. Yeah. So I think this brings us one step along the way, right? So the way I like to think of something like judgment or maybe like a key property of how I envision to achieve like artificial judgment, judgment in an artificial intelligent machine is the ability to kind of take multiple points of view into account, right? Uh, and reason about each of these points of view before you have to make a decision, right? So this is very different than the way most deep learning algorithms are trained today, which is basically they sense the world, they observe some pictures or maybe a video, and then they produce a prediction on how to act, right? Given this one point of view, that's kind of like a sensing to reacting, very reactive control, uh, which is, like I said, this is what neural networks are really very optimized to do today, and they're extremely good at doing that. Uh, but I would say that we're still very far away from having a neural network that can kind of reason about different points of view and how much it should be trusted in one point of view versus another point of view. Obviously, one aspect of that is first you need to understand how a neural network should be trusted in these different cases. Uh, so I think we're kind of on our way uh, to beginning to reason in that direction, right? And I think one critically important step for us is self-inspection of the model. So how can the model inspect itself and kind of have the self-understanding to understand its own confidence, right? How much it should trust itself. And that's, I think, one, one level along that, that idea of judgment, right? I think there's still definitely some other branches we need to get to. Um, but I, I'm I think this is why I'm very excited about this field, because I think it does bring us closer to exactly that point that you just mentioned. And that's like reasoning and judgment and, and yeah, making more intelligent decisions, not just really reacting based on what we see. Right. right. And even if we're getting closer to having some of this, you know, basic self understanding for machines, right now, there's no legal framework for who's at fault if a machine makes a mistake. So how do we distinguish between interpretability, explainability, and transparency of these AI systems when we don't have a legal framework in place? Yeah, so I personally think like things like ownership over AI is a very thought-provoking issue right now because especially right now, we're starting to see the emergence of a lot of these models go from the lab to the real world. And that's, I think, something very unique within the past five years. And that's so exciting. Um, but as that happens, as that transition to the real world happens, uh, we have to like consider these things, right? Because they are going to make mistakes in the real world. There's no system that's going to be 100% perfect 100% of the time. Uh, it's all about how we can. So I, I really like this quote that uh, it basically says, every model is going to fail. Right. The difference is that when the only models that are really good for you is the ones that you can know when they're going to fail. Right. So if you know when your model is going to fail, that's far more useful to us than just having a model that doesn't fail at all. Even So we'd rather have a lot of trust in how much we can trust our models. Right. And really placing a lot of focus on that aspect than simply having a model that we assume will like never fail. We're trying to build a model that will never fail, which I think is a, maybe like not even a possible task, right? So um, yeah, in, in terms of in, uh, interpretability and explainability, and yeah, I, I feel like these are all very related terms to uncertainty and trust, right? So having an interpretable machine learning model to some degree means that we as humans can kind of step inside the model and say, if the network told this autonomous vehicle to turn right at this intersection, why did it, what did it see in the model or what did it see in the data that told it to turn right, right? So like dissecting kind of why it makes these decisions is extremely important. And with a system that's so data driven, right? Like these systems are not really hard coded by humans. They're just learning based on data that can be extremely difficult. And I would say actually one more point is that's quite interesting in this area is that when we talk about interpretability, I feel like there's a lot of maybe misconception or fuzziness around that word, right? So uh, in terms of uncertainty estimation, I, I really like this definition because I feel like we can quantify it. It's a numerical, it's, a, it's something that has numerical meaning. So the uncertainty or the confidence of a model 
if it's a good confidence metric, it means that if our confidence is 90%, then we should fail on average 10% of the time, right? Or if our confidence is 99%, we should only fail 1% of the time. So we can have this level of like calibration and confidence. One thing I think is really interesting about uncertainty and explainability, I feel like these are much harder things to define for humans even. So if I say what makes a machine learning model interpretable or what do you want from your like best machine learning model if it has interpretability, what does that look like? I think that's a, something that you'll get so many different answers on in the community even. So even amongst people that really research this every day, everyone has kind of different levels of what they think that we require when we talk about interpretability. So one example could be, let's say in the case of autonomous driving, uh, interpretability could literally mean like if the car says turn right, uh, can you highlight for me the pixels in the input image that caused this car to turn right? So just, just like make the pixel brighter if it's uh, if it's really contributing to this decision and make it like less bright or less highlighted if it's not. And that's one level of interpretability, right? That's explaining the decision in the context of the images that it sees. And that's actually something that we can do with modern neural networks. That's totally possible. But I feel like that's not what really people mean when they say interpretability. They want something a little bit more semantic or human understandable, right? So like describing the scene in semantic terms the car wanted to turn right because it saw that maybe there's a barrier on the left-hand side of the road and really describing things in a more natural language way. Now that's something that is significantly more challenging, but then I think it comes into this question of uh, when is this really truly necessary? And that's something I'm not totally sure of. Like as a community, what point will we converge to between like what we need to accept and what we want, right? So everyone wants interpretability, but I'm not sure that uh, we will not accept anything that is not interpretable as a society. Right, right. And you know, it's just so interesting because if you think about, you know, not so long ago, we were having these kind of moral and ethical debates just around if something malfunctioned in a manufacturing plant, who is at fault? Is it right. the engineer? Is it the manufacturer of that machinery? Is it the person who was supervising the person right. who was, you know, in that plant looking at the assembly line from A to B? Exactly. And, yeah. And I, I, yeah. maybe just to go off of that point, mm -hmm. because I think that's a great point. I think, and I wouldn't say it's even like always in the negative direction, right? Like sometimes in robotics or safety protocol domains, we really care about the negative direction, right? So like when a robot makes a mistake or when a system makes a mistake, whose fault is it, right? But I would actually say there's another interesting side of this discussion, which is the positive point of view as well. Like we have now robot or uh, machine learning systems that are creating new pieces of art and, and like drawing new generative pieces, right? Uh, who gets the money when these pieces of data uh, like art sell, right? Is it the person that created the data set? Is it the person that uh, the model was trained off of the paintings of this, right? So like if a model is trained off of paintings of Vincent van Gogh, right? Do like, who gets the, uh, who gets the credit in this case? Should it go and back and be attributed towards van Gogh's name? Or should it be towards like the person who designed this AI model? Yeah, I think, uh, I, I think it's so fascinating to think about this from both points of views almost, right? Like when you want to take credit and also uh, like kind of associate blame as well in the negative sense. Mm -hmm. Right, always. I think we're always kind of inclined to, to want to reap the benefits of something right. when it's good for us and distance <laughs> ourselves um, when it reflects poorly. That seems to be kind of yeah. just natural human instinct. I'm probably guilty of that myself. <laughs> okay, so I want to ask you uh, a question about a quote from a German philosopher whose name I am probably going to mispronounce. So Martin Heidegger theorized that the human technology relationship oscillates between suspicion and reliance until we accept the risk inherent to technology. Do you agree with this? Yeah, I would agree with this. I think so this really relates back to what we were just talking about in terms of interpretability and like how much do people really need interpretability versus what they think they need, but they actually just want. Uh, so I think there's a lot of wisdom in that statement, actually. And I think 
I think we've seen this multiple times, at least even in my lifetime, for sure. So, and definitely if we go back uh, a few decades, like the advent of so many groundbreaking technologies, I feel like have kind of gone through this life cycle. I think even this is kind of a, maybe a silly example, but I don't really like, or I'm always a little bit nervous when I fly, right? Because I don't really truly like understand like all of the mechanics of planes, right? But I know that other people do, and I know that I shouldn't really fear this. So maybe it's a unreasonable fear for me to fear flying, but I would say like, yeah, I think that has happened over society, right? Like the benefits that we get from being able to fly and air transportation vastly outweighs like my fear of like not understanding like all of the dynamics of how we can fly. So yeah, there's always this trade-off that goes in to like how we think about these great advances in technology. And now we're kind of seeing the beginning of the first stage of this with deep learning. Now deep learning is exiting the lab into the real world. But I think we haven't really seen like people's tolerance, right, for like how much we're willing to, uh, how much risk we're willing to accept with these technologies, right? So uh, if it, another really good example that I've, I've heard a lot uh, is if we have robot surgeons in, in some time in the, in the far future, I think we're not close to that point yet, but if we have like fully automated surgeries by robots and uh, we give a patient the choice between two surgeons, one is a robot surgeon that maybe cannot, exp let's go to the extreme case, that cannot explain any of its decisions, right? But it has like 99% success rate, mm -hmm. right? And it's been tested over a bunch of different patients. And you have another surgeon who's a human surgeon, fully explainable. If they make a mistake, they can tell you kind of their thought process and there's a lot of accounting that goes into mind. But let's say their success rate is significantly lower. That's for the purpose of argument's sake, let's say it's like 60%. A huge gap. Humans always say they want interpretability and explainability, but in this case, like what's the what's the threshold that you're willing to tolerate when you have such a large performance gap and it can be measured empirically? Uh, are you willing to accept that threshold? And uh, I mean, I think this is a very intriguing uh, point to think about because when you oscillate between these two scenarios. Uh, I think everyone will have a different level of a threshold, like how much risk are they willing to accept? But I think everyone does have a threshold, right? I don't think that's my personal belief, but I don't think that interpretability is a hard requirement for a lot of these systems. And there is always going to be that fluctuation, like you said, between one side to the other side, depending on different factors. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that, you know, as humans, we are very content to kind of forget about how technology has afforded us so many luxuries and that right. we don't necessarily need to wait in line and speak to a bank teller. We can just go to a machine and withdraw money, or I can open up my smartphone and call an Uber within seconds. I can, you know, open up my computer and right. I can rent an Airbnb in you know, any location that I want. So it's afforded us all of these luxuries, but then I think when it comes down to how is this going to personally affect me, I feel like people then are often believe that, oh, technology is kind of outpacing what I'm capable of conceptualizing. And this goes beyond my comprehension. It's right. about my own health and safety. Right. And um, that to people is really frightening. Yeah, I think totally. I think, and in fact, we're seeing this today, potentially more than ever with the pandemic and the vaccines, right? right? So everyone is having their own different viewpoints on the vaccines. I don't want to go too deep into this, but I think like this is like a, a hugely contentious topic, right? And yeah, I think uh, this is like another great example of this where we have like some groundbreaking technology, but we have different levels of thresholds on how willing the society is to accept it. And you can see the differences even throughout the world, right? Like different countries will have diff completely different ways of, of thinking about these groundbreaking technological advancements. 
Right, right. And I think, you know, it's going to kind of come down a lot to how we can maybe start teaching computer science early on. So right. it starts to become more ingrained in our consciousness from a young age. So as you said, similar to you with the plane ex example, we're right. understanding how these technologies work and to the point of our whole conversation, what they don't understand. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I think as long as we as humans can kind of trust the machine to be reliable when it doesn't know the answer actually, and, and planes are a great example of this. We have like so many sensors on the planes that constantly detecting like any minute changes that may happen and humans are alerted kind of immediately. Um, I think plane accidents that are like really out of the blue are really uh, quite rare in today's world. And that's because of really good monitoring and sensing on the robots themselves, right? So as long as we as humans have like some very reliable understanding of when the systems that we build don't actually know, uh, I don't mind it getting in the wrong answer here and there, right? So I think that's a, uh, that's a cost that is almost acceptable given the, like all of the benefits that these systems bring. Uh, because at least I know that before it makes those decisions, a human will be kind of looped in as a guardian uh, just to keep things safe, right? They're going to be looped in through the uncertainty, through the trust that they have through these all of these different measurements uh, to kind of make sure that they're kind of always the supervisors of the system, right? Absolutely. Well, Alex, this was so much fun. Thank you so much for speaking with me. I'm really excited to see all of the amazing work that you continue to do. Thank you so, so much for having me. It was a great discussion.